Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. It's Annabelle and in today's video I wanted to talk to you about semi-hydroponics. Now semi-hydroponics is an agro method that's not exclusively linked to orchids so I'm going to be talking about it in relation to orchids and why I choose this agro method, the adaptations that I've had to make in my environment which we've been following over the last few months uh, to look at their success and my kind of final thoughts on it as a growing method. Hopefully um, this will be provide a comprehensive introduction to people who aren't familiar with the growing method or who are new to this channel and a good reference point for kind of further discussion. So there are different elements to semi-hydro including pHing, which is quite a vital issue which we can maybe do a separate uh, look at and root adaptation. So I kind of wanted this to be the start of a series where in today's video we just discuss the basic principles of semi-hydroponic and a couple of adaptations that I've made to it and my final kind of thoughts on that as a growing method. So semi-hydroponics implies a constantly moist environment. Hydroponics as a growing method is basically a constant water flow around the root zone. Semi-hydroponics uses lecker mostly as a medium which wicks water and keeps the roots constantly moist yet airy. So I've picked a couple of example orchids that I'm still growing in full semi-hydroponic method with no adaptations to that method, which are the Phalaenopsis bellina red apple. My Samira is, and Violacea are also in straight semi-hydro. And also uh, Epis, Epicatlea Renee Marquez crossed with Cattleya schilleriana. I've picked these two because they don't have many issues with the actual semi-hydro straight growing method, no adaptations, and we'll come on to some adaptations that I've made after we talk about some issues I ran into. As an introduction, Phalaenopsis bellina red apple will be our model for today. So semi-hydro implies a reservoir of water in which we place lecker beads and we fill these right up to the top. There are no ventilation holes, there are only a couple of drainage holes higher up which dictate your reservoir level and these we use for flushing the reservoir and obviously flushing to remove any salt buildup that appears at the top of the pot. Now for me semi-hydro works very well for certain types of orchids. It's not always easy to predict which orchids it's going to work for and which orchids it's not going to work for. But when it does work, it's fantastic. So what we're doing is we're using these clay beads called lecker beads, and these wick water, so they absorb water. So they take water from the reservoir and they transmit it throughout the pot. In theory, they transmit it evenly throughout the pot. In practice, what I tend to get is a dry top layer where the rate of evaporation is kind of exceeding the wicking efficiency. And I feel that this is exacerbated when you've got a very thirsty orchid. And the differences between a rootless orchid in semi-hydro and a very actively growing orchid in semi-hydro are huge. Now, this has got condensation all the way up the pot because I have just flushed this orchid through. Um, the cat layer may be a better example of the dry kind of top layer that I'm talking about. So we can see at the top of the pot, we've got some salt deposits. If we pick up one of these lacquer beads. Can you see it kind of glistening? So this is where fertilizer salts are being transmitted from the reservoir where we've got our nutrient solution up through the pot and then the water is evaporating and leaving the salt crystals on this top layer. This top layer stays quite dry anyway. So if this was a moist top layer, those salt crystals would be in solution. However, we've got a dry top layer. So in addition to the dryness and of the clay media, which when dry will pull moisture from anything that touches it that's moist, including a root tip, we've also got a bit of a salt buildup at the top of this pot. Now this cat layer does not care about that at all. Many will care about that. This one has no issues. It's got very tough, very hardy roots. Same goes with the Phalaenopsis bellina for some reason. However, I have many orchids that the roots will touch this top layer, whether it's dry because it's just not got any moisture in or it's also got the added 
issue of having a salt buildup at the top of the pot, which we should be flushing through regularly. So in theory, we shouldn't get that, but in practice, there is always gonna be, if your nutrients are present in excess, a slight buildup in your pot, which is why we flush regularly to remove that. I've been a bit lax with this orchid, but this provides an illustration of both the dry top layer and of the need for flushing through your pot. So for these orchids, this isn't an issue at all. However, for many orchids, when their roots touch the dry top layer, their roots will desiccate. Now, this isn't the case in all environments. I think this is specific to environments with lower humidity or higher airflow. So I don't actually have particularly low in humidity. And yet I know some people with lower humidity who can grow oncidiums and very sensitive rooted orchids in straight semi-hydro with no issues. I can't do that. Um, I can't explain why other than maybe there are some factors that we don't take into consideration with semi-hydro that also affect how dry your top layer is. Semi-hydro is fantastic because we've got the inorganic clay pebbles. These are what's in the pot. Due to sphere packing, you will always have air gaps between each of the clay pebbles because they're a sphere, they can't pack together. So we've got constant air gaps between each of the pebbles. So this provides a great environment for gas exchange around the root zone. Anyone who's been growing orchids a while will definitely have come across the term uh, aeration and ventilation around the root zone. In the majority of cases that we're going to discuss today, uh, if not all of the cases, we're talking about epiphytic orchids. Terrestrial orchids, um, completely different matter, so I'm not going to be talking about those today, we're just talking about epiphytic orchids. So epiphytic orchids, the roots obviously are designed to both attach to trees and draw moisture. In nature, would have an environment where they have optimal gas exchange. So this is what we mean when we say orchid roots having ventilation so that they can breathe. What we're actually talking about is aerobic respiration. The same way that we respire, orchids also respire this way. They photosynthesize in order to produce their sugars and then they obviously respire to produce energy. So aerobic respiration obviously involves oxygen. Photosynthesis involves carbon dioxide. These metabolic reactions are actually the inverse of each other. They're basically exactly the same, but the opposite way around. So aerobic respiration occurs in, I think, all orchid tissue, but it must occur in the root zone to a greater extent. I'm having difficulty finding literature references for this, specifically for orchids, but there are many uh, literature references available for normal plants uh, about the respiration and metabolic activity of the root zone. So I'm going to kind of pull different sources together when I'm talking about this and my interpretation on it. Disclaimer, I'm not an orchid biologist or a plant biologist. I am a, I work in research, so I'm a biologist in terms of human cells, but I'm kind of pulling that knowledge as background to discuss this with you today. So aerobic respiration is occurring in the roots, which means that they need oxygen. They also potentially need carbon dioxide because they, when wet and exposed to light, will start to produce chlorophyll. So this means that they're capable of photosynthesizing. This potentially could indicate that they can achieve their own balance within a pot. If they are exposed to light, they are often green in epiphytic orchids, which means that they're producing chlorophyll. This only occurs when wet, for some reason, that we can see the green. However, it must always be present. So they're able to photosynthesize, which will produce oxygen as a byproduct. They then respire using that oxygen, which produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct, which then feeds the photosynthesis. And this can occur at different times depending on the type of orchid. But we can assume that to some extent, there is going to be gas exchange occurring in the form of both oxygen and carbon dioxide intake and uh, output around the root zone. In addition to this, they're obviously going to need a fresh supply of oxygen and carbon dioxide because not all roots are exposed to light, so not all roots are going to be photosynthesizing. This was just the kind of hypothesis that I had 
in regards to routes that can photosynthesize, maybe achieving their own gas exchange balance. So they need a constant supply of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now obviously gas molecules are extremely small molecules, so we can achieve this by providing little pockets of air in the pot. And when we say air, really we are just referring, I believe, to carbon dioxide and oxygen. So any media that has kind of pores in will also provide aeration around the root zone, but we've also got gaps, quite large gaps in these cases where there are little air pockets. And this means that despite having a constantly moist environment, because the water is being held in the media, we also have little air pockets where gas exchange can occur. And this can be resupplied from fresh air um, quite easily because gas molecules are very small. So they ha don't have to have physical airflow around the roots to be able to permeate. In addition to this, uh, molecules will always move from kind of high to low concentration to achieve equilibrium. So there's always going to be like a drive to replenish the uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the pot, as long as you've got environments where there is actual physical air pockets that this can happen in. Now, if we were going to submerge these completely in water, you might think they would die. However, if the roots grow into the water reservoir, they don't. They can obviously adapt to some extent as they're growing. Even with my vandas that I've potted, the aerial roots don't die, which brings me on to another point about root adaptation. So in theory, roots can't adapt once they've grown, but in practice, I've seen that roots with actively growing root tips seem to be able to adapt all the way along the root to some extent. The aerial roots of vandas that I've potted don't die. This is an example of a Neostylus lucinary, and I've only got this quite recently as a replacement for my other one, which has since recovered. So I've now got two, but slightly different color forms. So this Neostylus lucinary is a primary cross between Neophenicia falcata and Rhynchostylus celestis, and it takes a lot of its traits in terms of the roots from the Rhynchostylus celestis. I potted this. This is the root that it came with, and it's now branched. We've got these roots that it came with, branching and kind of going down into the media, but they're not so surprising. I think the surprising thing here is I potted a root that was aerial when I got it, and it's not died. In fact, it's branched new root tips from it. And I found this with a lot of the vandas that I've potted, is that the roots aren't dying, they're branching new root tips, which kind of contradicts the black and white view of once roots are grown and adjusted to the environment, they then can't adapt. I believe they actually can, but the adaptation process is a lot easier if that root has a growing root tip somewhere along it. It seems to be driving more energy into that root and maybe make it more capable of adapting. This is what I've found in my environments, my experience, and I just wanted to share that with you because I found that it's a very interesting observation. And I've since discussed this with a few people who kind of say that they notice the same thing. And we don't actually talk about this that much that I that I'm aware of. I don't think we discuss this enough. So I think it's really good to open discussion on this. And it's very relevant to semi-hydro, but it's also very relevant to any um, root adaptation process. We say wait for new roots to emerge, but also I think that waiting for the existing roots to show active growth is also important in retaining those roots because the plant's obviously pumping energy into those roots. And I think that there must be something that happens that means that it can then adapt better to a new environment. So coming back a little bit to why I kind of believe the roots are able to grow down into the reservoir. This is a specific type of Vandacious orchid called Vandopsis lysochilioides. And this is a terrestrial to lithophytic Vandacious type, which is large and hot growing and is a notoriously slow grower. And since putting it into semi-hydro, it's just taken off. It really wasn't doing very well for me at all until I kind of and read that it is lithophytic and has kind of constantly moist roots in nature. So I was kind of like, well, maybe I should put it into semi-hydro. So this is one of my first Vendacious orchids that went into semi-hydro. So here we've got 
an old root than it had when it was in a bark mix and being treated more like a regular vanda. It doesn't look so great, but it kept growing. It kept growing, it's grown down into the reservoir and it's now starting a little branch. This is a very slow growing orchid, so this maybe isn't a great example for a representative for other orchids, but you can see it's also producing a new root there. And we've got some other roots in the pot, but this is the best example. So it's grown down into the water reservoir. Now, previous explanations for this would be that the water reservoir kind of goes up and down, and I can see another branch actually just starting there. And so it's not a permanently wet environment. Well, actually, I keep this topped up pretty much all the time. So this bit of the root is certainly in a permanently wet environment. So why is it able to grow if we're saying that it has to have air around it to survive? I don't believe that this is the case and I can't really explain that. Maybe the fact that this root is photosynthesizing and producing oxygen means that it's still able to um, have gas exchange levels in the root zone. I don't know. I just wanted to point that out. The roots that grow into the reservoir, they don't die. And this seems to, in my environment, be irrespective of how full, like, I don't let this water reservoir dry out. So it's an interesting observation, I think, and maybe challenges slightly our commonly held belief that roots need air around them to survive. Um, well, not all roots. And I think it's very dependent on the environment in which they're growing and how they've grown, at what stage they were in development when you put them into that new environment. And I can't explain this fully, but I think that this is a very common thing with semi-hydro. Roots that grow into the reservoir don't die. The existing roots on a plant may die when you put them into semi-hydro, in theory, because you're putting them into a drastically different environment and we've got that old roots can't adapt rule. But it seems like they can. So this is the Aerides uh, Corac Koki crossed with Rhynchostylus retusa that I talked to you about previously in my uh, video on kind of Rhynchostylus uh, that I'll link you to down below in the description. So we've got a new root growing there. But these are the old roots. And they were aerial. They weren't potted when I got them. And I put them into semi-hydro and they didn't die. They actually kept growing, as you can see from how it's grown between the lacquer beads there and the fact that we've got other root tips kind of coming off the old root system. I've kept this orchid warm. It's a warm to hot grower and semi-hydro will always be a cooler environment because the evaporative effect that you get with a semi-hydroponic system means that you get evaporative cooling. Clay media is always kind of cooler than the external environment. So you're gonna constantly get this cooling effect around the root zone, which means that hot growers need to be kept warm and you need to be very conscious of this when putting a hot grower into semi-hydro. And hot growers, I would even class things as phalaenopsis, as hot growers. Now you may notice that some of these orchids I've now kind of brought in front of you have pumice mixed into the mix. This is a method that I've kind of developed to mitigate the dry top layer of semi-hydro. So I mix in sort of pumice, maybe a 50-50 lecker to pumice ratio. And then I also put a layer of non-wicking pebbles on the top. And this stops new roots from desiccating when they're hitting the dry top layer of lecker and also keeps the moisture level in the pot quite high. This one hasn't been flushed or anything in a while. This is just the natural kind of moisture levels that are retained in the pot. And you can see that it's kind of moist all the way up to here where this layer of gravel starts and the gravel is non-wicking so it doesn't pull moisture from root tips it doesn't pull moisture into it either so this can be dry and the roots still bury into it and hit that more moist under layer there's not going to be any salt build up on this because they can't absorb the nutrient solution so it's kind of a win-win situation and my orchids have really responded incredibly well to having pumice added into the mixes. One example of this is the Phalaenopsis cornus servi at FMA Chatelaidiae. So this one, unfortunately, it did not enjoy straight semi-hydro and it basically didn't grow very much for me for a long time. Since putting it into a pumice mix, it started a new leaf and a new root and it's continued growing its roots that it had really nicely. So I've actually got a much better root system on it 
than I had when this one went into semi-hydro. So the mixture of pumice into the mix, combined with a top layer of non-wicking pebbles, seems to have really helped this orchid out. You'll notice that this one isn't in a traditional semi-hydro setup. It's actually in a self-watering system, which I believe is actually a little bit more of an airy environment than semi-hydro, but we'll talk about this in a separate video. It does have a larger reservoir as well, so the reservoir will last the orchid longer. So I think that that kind of covers the bases that I wanted to touch on today with regards to semi-hydroponics as a growing method. Another thing that I will mention is that pH is very important in semi-hydroponics because we're dealing with inorganic material. Essentially, we're dealing with rocks. Rocks have a neutral to al alkaline pH. Orchids need a slightly acidic pH to be able to absorb nutrients correctly because the nutrients are most optimally in solution at an acidic pH. And this is what they're adapted to. In nature, they're growing on trees and on bark and in moss and maybe with leaf litter slightly burying water kind of constantly dripping on but constantly having access to replenished um, gases and airflow around the roots. Moss and bark, leaf litter, all of that sort of thing, they're all going to have a slightly acidic pH. That'll vary depending on the substrate, so moss has a much more acidic pH than bark, especially when it's starting to break down, but bark still has a slightly acidic pH, not a neutral to alkaline pH. So if you were going to never pH your nutrients in a semi-hydro system, your orchids are not going to be absorbing their nutrients optimally. So you're basically going to be feeding them half rations. Therefore, this maybe is something to really consider if you're using inorganic grow methods. And one person I would refer you to on this is Rick L. Orchids, who I will link down below, who doesn't grow in semi-hydro, but he grows pretty much exclusively in rocks. Therefore, he's kind of a great, great person for anyone to go to if they want advice on pHing, because he's grown in this way for many, many years, and he's grown orchids in this way for many years. So he has a really great handle on the pH of inorganic media, how this can affect orchids and things that you need to do to mitigate this. I've also made down below where I talk more about what pH means to orchids and nutrient absorption and nutrient solubility in solution. So that's something to really bear in mind with semi-hydro and inorganic growing methods in general. You will need to keep an eye more on the pH than you would if you're going to grow in organic media, say. A really great point about semi-hydro is that the inorganic material will never break down, so you're never going to get acidification around the root zone as your media is breaking down, and it basically eliminates the need for regular repotting. So you only need to repot when your orchid actually outgrows its current pot. Another fantastic advantage to growing semi-hydroponically is your orchid constantly has access to a reservoir of nutrients and water. So it can just constantly absorb nutrients. It's not limited by wet dry cycles. And wet dry cycles are really only necessary to allow correct gas exchange in organic media. But in inorganic media, there's constant air pockets. It's not like with bark, when it absorbs water, it goes soggy, it's holding onto more moisture and it's potentially closing up those air pockets in solution. So you need to allow it to dry out to really open up all those air pockets and allow gas exchange around the root zone to really occur efficiently. With inorganic, there's a constant supply of air, there's a constant supply of moisture and nutrients, so your orchid isn't limited in how it grows. And I definitely noticed faster growth on my orchids as a result of this. So that's kind of another pro in the inorganic media, uh, constantly moist systems versus organic. But I really didn't want to make this an inorganic versus organic video because there's definite pros and cons to both and both are very valid methods to grow. I really just wanted to chat with you guys about things to keep in mind really when you're growing in semi-hydroponics or inorganic media, an explanation of how it works and why it's a good thing for orchids, but also why it has in the past for me been a bad thing for orchids and the things that I've done to overcome this and so that I can more efficiently use semi-hydroponics and inorganic as a grow method. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and I'm sorry if it got a bit rambly. I tend to get quite excited by these sort of topics and go off on tangents a little bit. So I've tried to really rein myself in on that, um, but I apologize if this did get a little bit lengthy. 
please do leave any comments or questions down below and obviously I'll do my best to answer. I wanted this to be the first in a series where there are reference points. So if there is anything that you're really unclear on that I haven't covered, because it doesn't always occur to me uh, where I've missed something out, please do drop a comment down below and what I can do is expand on this video in the series with answers to questions that people had. Thank you so much for watching as always and if you enjoyed this video then don't forget to hit the thumbs up or subscribe to my channel for more regular orchid updates if you're interested in seeing more of this type of video and I will see you guys later. Bye!